Welcome to another episode of Real Talk with Real Fit Pros. It's your host with the most, Jonathan Laddermilk. And as always, I've got my partner in crime, my PIC, Mark the Fitness Ninja Zamanoff. And we've got a damn good special guest that we've got on the show today. I'm really excited to have him on. Um, we've connected about a year and a half ago, and it's been awesome to watch what he's been doing in the companies that he's been involved with. And I'm just excited to extract a lot of gold nuggets from this gentleman today. But before we get into the show, if this is your first time listening, I need you to do me a favor. I need you to go ahead and like and subscribe and leave us a review. Crazy thing about that is that it helps us get this message out in front of more of our Fit Pro brothers and sisters so that we can help them get paid with their worth as well. So with that being said, I'm going to pass the baton off to my man, Mark, and we're going to kick this show off properly. I like that little drum roll. We need like a pick up on that. You know, yeah. I like I need like, I'm like, you know, try, I yeah. hope that carried over into the audience. You gotta do it on the microphone. You gotta do it on the microphone. There you go. <laughs> I'm sure that's gonna be wildly entertaining for anybody listening to this. Uh thank you, John. You know, it's a beautiful day in the neighborhood. The sun is shining. We're recording this the day before Thanksgiving. So everybody's prepping to get their face stuffed. And uh, if you are a fitness professional, please know this is a golden time of the year, man. This is the time where you can put out all the social media posts and make everybody feel terrible about their choices. And then you just reel them all in and bring them back to you and make sure that you have the solution for them. It's great. It's I call it it's eating season. Like it's just straight up eating season. Um, so anyway... Yes, our guest today. I'm excited about this one too. Like I, you know, this is gonna be the first time I've actually had a conversation with this man, and uh, he's got one hell of a resume that I'm about to go through here real quick. He is currently the vice president of International at AMP. He is group partnerships with the ISSA, which is the International Sports Sciences Association, and many of you may be certified through them. Uh, prior to that, he was the executive vice president of PTA Global, a global fitness education company. He has over 26 years experience in training and training management, including being a health club owner and the fitness director for two large multi-use health clubs where his teams grew revenue exponentially. Prior to working in the private fitness industry, he worked in law enforcement for the state of California, California, sorry, uh, <laughs> For 22 years, where he ultimately managed statewide training for over 400 law enforcement officers and 200 trainers, including being the director and an instructor at a state police academy and adjunct faculty at several colleges for topics, including physical fitness. So you see this is permeating through his life here. He is also an ultra triathlete, which we're definitely going to ask questions about this. He has done several Ironmans two double Ironmans under 36 hours, a triple Ironman under 60 hours, and a quintuple Ironman in under five and a half days. That is amazing. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the show, Dan Duran. Happy to have you here, Dan. Oh, thanks. Thanks a lot, John and Mark, for having me. And uh, that's why I live in Idaho, brother. <laughs> we'll just leave it at that. <laughs> that is a uh, point taken. Very nice. Uh, so, Dan, before we dive into your story and all the awesome things that you've done in your career, we kick this thing off with story time. So what do you got for us? Well, you know, I'm sure the, the, the listeners out there know that this is the only thing that I was uh, prompted with is we're going to ask you for a funny story. And it's funny, the, the, the first thing that came to mind and the only thing that came to mind actually has to do with triathlon. And it was uh, when I did my first Ironman. So uh, I, my first Ironman was in Cozumel, Mexico. In fact, they just had it again uh, a few days ago. And uh, I was nervous and all those things that go along with it. Uh, the, a lot of people had talked about the open water swim where mass start, you got thousands of people all jumping in the ocean at one time and they're calling over the top of you, et cetera. And I thought, oh, this is gonna be really interesting. Um, we, we ended up having to be bused to a new location because of bad waves. So it's getting the delay, the start time's getting delayed. And I'm getting nervous again about this, this mass start and then my first Ironman and, and, and so forth. And as, as I get off the bus, I realize I've got to go to the bathroom. 
And it's the kind of go to the bathroom that I can't just go behind the bus, right? <laughs> so I'm asking, and, we're, and this is not planned. Last minute, they changed our launch site. So I'm like, where do I find a bathroom? And they pointed me into this like hotel atrium area. I run in there and there's a long line of, in the men's room and the women's room, just a bunch of people that also have to go to the restroom. Very common before a race, right? So I'm waiting and I'm waiting and I'm waiting and I'm, some girls need to, they want to use the men's room and I'm letting them cut in front of me. I'm trying to be polite and be a gentleman. And I end up becoming the last person in line to use the restroom. And all these people are lined up getting ready to start the race. I'm fog, I'm putting my scoop and spitting in my goggles and putting them on my eyes in the bathroom so that I'm ready to run out and jump in the ocean. I'm ready to go. And, and I, I finally get into the stall and I hear, Burr! The race started. <laughs> so by the time I get done with my business and make it out on the beach, I was the only swimmer starting the race. Everybody wow. else was ahead of me. So the mass went, the mass start never became a problem. So that was, <laughs> that was my story. You know, I, uh, if you're familiar with OCR at all, Dan, I just got done doing the world's toughest mutter a couple of weeks ago and they have so many porta potties out there. It's insane. But what they do is they corral everybody in for the start. And then it's like 30 minutes until you take off because we got to do the national anthem. And then a guy gives a speech and we do all the things. And by the time you take off, you know, you got guys just branching off the course everywhere, going and trying to pee somewhere because yeah. you've been standing there for 30 minutes. You got your, your, uh, you know, pre-workout flowing through you and you just <laughs> made a sandwich and, oh man, it's a mess. <laughs> so yeah, that was what came to mind. I don't know if that's what you're looking for, but I'll never forget that day. Oh yeah. It's so yeah. funny how many stories we have that involve the restroom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. New innovative thing, Dan. You found a way to incorporate the restroom in the fitness. So I can yeah, that's right. I got a potty story. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's dig into this. So Dan, like I said before, obviously you have an extensive resume. You've been in this industry for a very, very long time. Let's go back to what got you into the industry in the first place, and then we'll just kind of go from there. Do you mind if I ask your, uh, a question to your question? And I assume you mean the private industry, the fitness industry, the gym world we live in. Yes, sir. Yeah, that's a really, uh, I know this is a common response, but that's a really good question and an interesting story. I, as you mentioned in my uh, background, was teaching fitness at police academies and fire academies and so forth. So, and, and I was always kind of a gym rat. I've been lifting weights um, like consistently since I was in my early twenties, took a dive into thinking I was gonna become a power lifter, which I never got strong enough to be, you know, competitive at it. But I, I've always loved the gym. And I was that guy in the gym six, seven days a week, usually seven, uh, working out. And then, uh, you know, top on top of that, my career. And my career involved a lot of movement, fitness, a lot of, uh, you know, I taught a lot of self-defense and firearms. So I was always on my feet and always doing something. So it, it, it took, gave me a real beating physically between all of that, plus studying martial arts and teaching martial arts. Um, and, you know, there was no rest. There was no recovery. I didn't understand the concept of it. And I didn't care to. It was go hard or go home. I'll drink when I'm done. I'll sleep when I'm dead kind of a mentality. And all of that during that time period, I had a lot of people ask me at the gym, you ever think about being a personal trainer? And I already had a career, so you know, really wasn't something I was thinking about. Well, this, the state of California at the time was doing a lot of cutbacks, and so we'd have to take a Friday off, and then two Fridays off, and then I think it eventually became three Fridays off, and that's a cut in pay. And so I thought, well, shoot, this might be a good time for me to, to consider this personal training gig. So I bought an NASM CPT package and started studying. Meanwhile, here's the thing that uh, I've only really started sharing recently, and it's the first time I've shared this uh, on an open forum like this. I'm an alcoholic, and I my my progression of you know I'll call it a disease. That's what it's classified at, but the progression of my addiction was continuing, and I was the weekend guy or the once a month guy. It wasn't the daily guy. They call it a periodic drinker, and uh, so I'd go on two three day binges, and it started affecting my health as well. It started affecting my health to where it was affecting my work. It was affecting my, uh, you know, I was overweight by 50 pounds. I had high cholesterol, high blood pressure, ulcers, arthritis, 12 years of chronic back pain, 
Um, the list goes on. When I read it, it's about twice that long. So I was falling apart, yet here I was trying to tell people how to be tough and survive a, a, a battle when I was lucky to be, you know, getting out of bed every day. And it all came together in the perfect storm. And I went, okay, you know, I, I, have, I went on a binge. I came out of it. I said, I need to get help. So I went and got help uh, for, for my, my addiction. And as I was doing that, I was studying my NASM CPT. And I thought, you know what, maybe I'll take a, a dive and just try this. And so I asked uh, at the gym I was a member of, hey, you know, are you interested in having a, me on staff? And they said, well, you got to work 30 hours a week. And I thought, well, I can't do that and go back to the state. And so let me dabble in it. So I jumped into the world of personal training. And uh, it was the first time in the private industry coming from the government. I, I, I got into that uh, pretty quickly, started without any coaching. Unfortunately, I think we see a lot of it in our industry. It's like, here you go. Good luck. Um, <laughs> and I was very blessed and fortunate. I built a book of business very quickly, became very successful, very fast. Uh, within five months was making what I was making with the government because I was teaching weight loss classes at night and training people during the day. Um, and I thought, you know what, this, this could work. And within, I think 10 and 11 months, I became a fitness director. And from there, it was all the private world of fitness. And again, I was very blessed to have been successful at it early on. And it saved my life. That was the beginning of exercise saving my life because I was definitely on a one-way path to the grave. Mm -hmm. Oh, and I, been sober over 12 years now so that's awesome man yeah. good for yeah. you and i uh, i think you and i may have talked a little bit in dm alcohol something that i've struggled with too man i'm coming up on about a year and three or four months now since congratulations it. yeah it's, man it's crazy what letting go of that will give you oh gosh <laughs> you know, it's but it's a battle though you know it is a battle and uh my wife is what we call a normie when you're in the program of recovery she's normal and even though uh you know she was instrumental in my recovery and is just the most amazing wife and more than i deserve she still doesn't understand why why i'm wired the way i am you know it's, it's and i'm like i it's whatever i do i do like all in and uh it, it, there's no halfway there's no middle ground and sometimes that's a benefit i think uh but certainly it could be detrimental but folks that don't drink and for the listeners out there um, who are struggling with addiction, I know that's not the topic of this. And, uh, but I would reach out and say, there's a lot more of us out there than I think I realized when I came into this. Um, don't be afraid to ask for help. Don't be afraid to reach out to me. Don't be afraid to reach out to John. Um, they're, they're, it's completely doable and it's a life changer. So uh, it's never too late. I didn't, I didn't figure it out till I was 40. Yeah. Uh, so first of all, thank you for sharing that, Dan. Like, really do appreciate the transparency with that. And, you know, it, it's it's interesting because so John and I are in this network called Apex, and it's basically full of entrepreneurs and business owners. So we tend to see more of it around us as far as that addiction goes. And you're right, like it's all in on everything. It's all in on business. It's all in on fitness, but it can also be all in on drugs and alcohol and porn yeah you know, all the destructive behaviors too. And, and, you know, we're fortunate that we have people around us that won't judge and that people can say, Hey, I got a problem. And people will, you know, say, Hey, I can help you or let's find you some resources where I think a lot of times out in the, in the rest of the world, you know, it's still this weird taboo subject. And, and especially around men, you know, we're just supposed to suck it up and figure it out and all that, you know, all that bull, bullshit macho shit that people say, um, and, and this time of year is hard too. I, I think, you know, when the holidays roam around and, and if there's already dysfunction in the family or whatever the case may be, I think it becomes even more, you know, front and center for people to deal with. So thank you for sharing that. And definitely if you're listening to this and you have any type of problem like that, like reach out to any of us, we have so many amazing resources around us to help and you're, you're way better off you know, raising your hand and saying, Hey, help than suffering in silence. Hey, hey man. And, and you called it Mark. Uh, and I do, it, it, it certainly afflicts anybody, man, woman, et cetera. But I, but as a man speaking as one, it, it with that personality, that's like, I'm going to do this on my own. I don't need anybody's help. And, uh, I, you know, that the grind mentality, um, all that did was buy me years and years and years that I didn't need to, to be in that addiction. So humble yourself, come to your knees, 
put your hands in front of you and say, I need some help here, man. Uh, there's, that, is a, that is the true sign of strength, not weakness. Agreed. Well, let, let's talk about how you turn that addictive personality that I suffer from as well to obviously to a lot of productive results. So, you know, yeah. you're, you, you've gotten to the fitness director role, you've worked your way up, kind of share with us what that journey was like for you throughout your career to obviously to where you're at today, which is really awesome. Yeah, thank you, John. Um, one of the things that, that happened during my early, like the beginning of recovery is I met somebody who has become a mentor, a friend, a brother, and instrumental in my career. Uh, and that was Rodney Korn. So Rodney at the time was co-founding and just kicking off PTA Global. Prior to that, he was the director of education at NASM. Super bright guy, um, super nice man. And he mentored me in the gym. So he connected with me with people to help me be a better director. Uh, he also mentored me a lot on the exercise science and programming and all of those things. And the biggest takeaway that I got from Rod was recovery. So no more seven days a week, killing yourself three nights a week, you know, I'll sleep when I'm dead. He had taught me the importance of recovery which became massive, not only for my results and my health, but for the people I got to train. So that friendship with Rodney is actually what led me down the path that, I, that I'm on today because he gave me the opportunity to be a contractor with PTA Global early on. Then uh, one of the co-founders, Scott Hobson of PTA Global offered me a, another fitness director role in Atlanta. So I went to work for him. So there's PTA Global again. And uh, so I'm working for Scott for three months. Then Rodney says, hey, will you come work for PTA Global? I'm like, Scott, I'm sorry, buddy, but you know, I love teaching and I love uh, training education and running education programs. So I'd like to leave you to go to the company you helped found. So that's an awkward conversation to have. Um, so I, at that point, I went to work for PTA Global, and I think I was in a biz dev role and then a director of education role initially. Cool. Um, but it, all credit to Rod and uh, everything he taught me and continues to teach me. And that really launched me. And from there, I've been in the education space uh, with PTA Global until it was sold and then here at ISSA for the last nine months. Awesome. So here's what I'm curious about. There's, there's this recurring theme of your career of being in leadership positions. So taking it back from law enforcement, you're in charge of this, you're in charge of training, you're in charge of physical fitness. You know, you, you go into the, the private sector and within a year you're a fitness director. So do you feel you've always had those leadership qualities? Where did they come from? And, and who do you currently look towards, whether it's, you know, mentorship, books, podcasts, whatever, to continue to develop that skill set? I love that you asked that. And man, I mean, we could talk for an hour just on that topic. I think there's, you know, there's, I read a lot uh, and it, there's no particular author and I'm bad at remembering names, but I read a lot of books about uh, uh, leadership. I particularly enjoy ones that are with a military style. So any book written by a Navy SEAL on leadership, I've read it. So I, I really like that mentality. And there, the question is often asked, are, are people born uh, leaders or do they become leaders? And I, I don't know the answer to that. I think there was probably something innate when I was younger because I'd heard, you know, even during my early, during my later childhood and early adult uh, that I was a leader and I didn't know, even know what that meant. I, side note, I hear that from my son's teachers, every single parent teacher conference and almost every single teacher for as long as I can remember, he's a sophomore in high school, but I tell him that he's like, he just rolls his eyes, you know, and I'm like, no, man, your people see you as a leader. So I don't know what it is exactly, but I know that in, as far as my development in it, I love it, not because I like to be the boss. I think that's a, definitely a wrong way of looking at leadership. I look at leadership as service and the more people I can serve, and help develop and help them aspire to, you know, reaching the goals they they are shooting, you know, want to 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 attain or reach. That's a true leader, and and what really excites me is is helping people, developing, uh, sending them to, you know, if I don't have answers, which most of the time I don't, you know, uh, given maybe a little bit of guidance on where to find the right answers. Uh, and, I, and I'm going to tell you a story because I think this is relevant, and, it, and it's. It ties into your question about mentorship. 
The first great, great example I had of leadership was the boss that hired me to run a fish hatchery. So I came from the Department of Fish and Game years ago and uh, worked in fish and wildlife world. And I had an opportunity to promote into uh, a role where I was running a fish hatchery up in uh, Northern California. So the guy interviewed me and he was in charge of everything. And so we did our standard interview and he said, is there anything you, know, you want me to know or add? And I said, yeah, Royce, I, you need to know that I've gone back to college because I need to get a degree to become a game warden. And the reason that I'm leaving where I'm working is we travel too much and this is important to me. So if I'm not able to go to school at night, et cetera, then this isn't gonna be a really good fit. And I'll never forget, he said, you give me 110%, Dan, I will help you be a game warden. You can definitely go to school. I'll move my, your schedule around to make sure you can take the classes you need. And I'm gonna introduce you to the chief for the region and I'm gonna get you hooked up on some ride-alongs. He did all that. I was hired, I think within a year, year later, I was only at that hatchery about a year, all because of him helping me do that. Mm -hmm. So that is like the leader that stands out in my past as what a true leader does is it's not about you and your mission. Uh, it's about the team you serve and, you know, hopefully they can help attain the mission together. Yeah. I love that story. And I think it's, you know, there's a lot of people in leadership that operate from scarcity. They're like, well, I don't want to, I want to develop you, but I don't want to develop you too much because then you'll leave me and then I got to go do this all over again versus understanding when you're put in that leader position, your job is to produce winners and champions. You Absolutely. Know? Absolutely. And speaking of that, I watched King Richard last night. Best freaking movie ever. So if you guys should definitely watch that because it goes over Venus and Serena Williams' father and the role that he played in developing them. Oh, okay. Good to yeah, know. Yeah, it was one of those like, let's go. And it's got Will Smith from Pursuit of Happiness. It's the same character with an accent. <laughs> I was like, oh, take my money. Anyway, that's what that made me think of anyway. I love it. I love it. So that, that's a great story, Dan. And, and again, it really is about leadership at that point. And that's the difference between a manager and a leader. You know, a, a boss just tells people what to do and lets them clock in and out and go. And, and, and a, but again, some of this is back to you being willing to speak up, knowing what you wanted. Mm -hmm. You obviously had clarity in that moment of here's my path and being wise enough to say, hey, if, if this isn't the way that I can operate, then this isn't for me. Yeah. So, you, yeah. You definitely need to know that and understand that. Um, in my opinion, the, I, I, uh, in my state career promoted very quickly, if you want to call it that, um, I rose up the chain. I was the youngest captain in the history of the department. Um, and, and it wasn't because I was, you know, sucking up to anybody. It was be, because I prepared. Um, we had very tough, uh, oral and written interviews to promote when I was with the state. So you prepare, you put the time in, you put the work in, you learn what it's going to take to be successful. And I think that's the, maybe what we need to do more of, to be honest with you, in uh, developing our, le oh, by the way, that's my wife walking behind me. I know we're on, <laughs> we're not, there's a podcast, but y'all can wave. Um, <laughs> but I, I think that we need to set a clear expectation of what those roles are so that and, and, and ensure that people are prepared to do them rather than you're a great trainer. And John, I know you experienced this because you were a highly successful trainer and went through the ranks, like you said, now you're doing your own thing. Mm -hmm. um, rather than here's my best trainer, let's make him a manager and right. good luck with that. There has to be a very clear expectation on what that role is. And further to that, there needs to be training and development in that role. Yeah, well said. And we've seen it with sales guys so many times in the fitness industry. You get a grocer. Oh, let's make them a GM. And then the club falls apart, you know? <laughs> yeah, get, yeah. That memberships are coming in, but God bless it. Everything else is on fire. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> You're perfect. absolutely right. So, yeah, I, I, I do think, I mean, it, 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 I, I also believe and I'm really, you're really making me think here because I, I, I wasn't, you know, well, first of all, we didn't, there's no script for today. And second, um, it's something that I'm really passionate about. So I'm trying to dig in deep. I think it, it, you have to approach it from a place of humility, but be willing to be a person of great strength. 
because when things go sideways, it's on you. It's not your team's fault. Uh, you have to make hard choices. You have to let people go. Uh, I've let more people go than, than you know, I, I'd like to be proud of, but that's to develop a team. Mm -hmm. and, and sometimes that's the best way. So it, I do believe it takes a very unique personality, but it can be developed. Yeah. So Dan, for, for the coaches that are listening to this, you know, we have a pretty wide range from, you know, people that work in a club to independent coaches, to gym owners. What would you say to them that don't really have that clarity? And it's something that John and I work with a lot of our coaches on getting clear on what that why is and, and beyond the hokey, like what's your why? Like, no, but like, you know, really, why do you wake up in the morning and go do the shit you don't want to do because you have all these other things you do want to do? So do you have any advice for people on just getting clarity in general with what they want in life that then leads to them having clarity in their career? That's a tricky one because uh, I've, I think we've all heard, turn your passion into your profit, right? Um, do something with your life that you're passionate about so it never feels like you're going to work. Then you hear from people like my financial advisor, who's a very wealthy man, who says, do something that's going to support you and your family and build you a re retirement and do that way you have the money to do the things you're passionate about doing. So he's an ultra triathlete. He's written books. He's my mentor. He's done a triple deca, by the way, that's 30 Ironmans in 30 days. And he's a financial planner. So he's doing the stuff he's passionate about, but he's chosen industry that's, that he's good at, but that is, is, uh, you know, offers him the opportunity. I think in our industry, most of us are here because we love exercise or we love helping others. We put it together. So when you talk about the why, I think that's pretty universal. So like you said, go drilling down into the why. I would drill more into the how. And that is, are you a professional? Because we are fitness professionals. We are not just trainers. We're pros. We help you know, in my case, save lives. My life was saved through exercise, but we certainly help change lives. We, we, give, we become the GPS and the support system so people can change their own lives. And, and, and it, who does that? Is it just a trainer in a slingshot or whatever you call tank top uh, with their muscles bulging out and pictures of themselves topless everywhere they go? <laughs> or is it somebody who's a professional who's wearing a collared shirt or a logoed shirt, their hair is combed, their clothes match, they're, they're well-groomed, they don't stink, they're not sweaty when they're coming to greet you as a, as a trainer. We need to act like freaking professionals. And I think that's what helped me at the age of 40 with no private industry background, build a book of business in four months that was just, I mean, I had a waiting list. And again, this isn't about bragging because I'm not awesome. It just, the, the stars lined up for me, but what was different about what I did when, I, when there was a gym full of people with a lot more years of training and in personal training, I was a professional. I was early, I was well-prepared, I was organized, I called people in advance. I looked the part, I acted the part, I didn't gossip, I didn't cuss. I was a professional. And that attracted people who were wanting to invest in professionals and it, it built a business in no time. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I just want to emphasize that grow up and be a professional because this isn't just something we do for fun. This is a profession and you need to take pride in it. If your passion is there and you want to help people, you want to help save lives and you want to be successful and actually be able to pay your bills with it, treat it like a profession, not a job. If you had a microphone in your hand right now, I would just tell you to drop it and walk away. Yeah, I, I'd like to make a call the motion to change Let's Go Brandon to Let's Go Dan. <laughs> Wait a minute. The context of that isn't right. Though, well, so. we'll work on that. That's the PR spin. That's what I do, Dan. We'll, we'll work on that part. Um, we need to develop a plan for our clients. We need periodized planning. You, would, you plan a wedding. You plan a vacation. You plan... A, a camping trip, you plan a hunting trip, you plan, but we get a client and we go, okay, I'm going to train this person Monday, Wednesday, Friday, you show up, you show up late. Uh, you don't have a workout plan. And if you do, it's just what you scribbled a few minutes before the workout. And it has no actual plan built to it. What am I, what are we trying to get to? So I'm not, you know, preaching that this is the periodization plan to use, et cetera, et cetera. What I'm getting at is be prepared. Be prepared and to treat each person 
as an individual person because it's called personal training. <laughs> I can't tell you how many times I came back, uh, I've come back from Idea World and somebody did a session uh, on some new exercise. And then the next day in the gym, you see all, all the trainers that went to Idea doing the same exercise with all their clients. You're like, okay, maybe it's appropriate, maybe it's not. But there, there's no such thing as a bad exercise. There's just a poorly prescribed exercise. So are we actually treating people like individuals and putting the work into correctly programming them for what their goal is, not your goal? Yeah. Sorry. That was a bit of a soapbox, but again, this is a profession, folks. Uh, a, a, a doctor has protocols they follow. A physical therapist has protocols that they follow very, very strictly uh, in, up to and including the full recovery process or always thinking ahead. We need to do the same thing. So Dan, here's my question then. Why do we have so many coaches that aren't treating this like a business and like a professional then? What, why do you think that is? I don't, I, that's a, I love that. And uh, for the listeners out there, uh, I, I, I got a little passionate there. So please don't think it's any kind of a, <laughs> it's you know, hey, worse you than what suck. Said, I promise. It, yeah, this isn't like a, hey, you suck. That's not what I mean <laughs> by it at all. What I'm trying to do is get behind the, the point that I'll make with John asking that question. And I don't, I believe that we need more development. We need more uh, coaching of coaches. Because other, and we need to put more work in on our own in always sharpening our saw. We mm -hmm. always need to be learning. And I don't mean off Google or Instagram, okay? That is not where we learn science. You need to be always learning and, and learning from everyone. I'm, you're not going to hear me give one brand. I represent a great brand, but I'm going to say, learn from as many people as you can, be mentored by as many people as you can. So I think it's both a lack of a continuing education with application and a, a lack of good coaching by what might be a fitness manager, or fitness director to, to mentor them. I was lucky. I had Rodney Korn. I mean, they don't get much smarter than that guy. And I know, he, I'm sure he would come in and my, like, oh my gosh, is Dan here? Because I can't get a workout in. Because I would ask him a question <laughs> every single time I saw him. Yeah. So be curious, be curious. I think that there's a gold nugget right there is, you know, being prepared and knowing the right questions to ask, right? I know that's been a huge growth that I've gone through this year was just getting clear on who I'm talking to and asking the right questions. And the growth on the back end of that has been exponential just by me getting intentional with the questions that I ask. So just wanted to highlight that. That's awesome. I love it. You're absolutely right. And, and uh, I, I, I can relate because again, a guy like Rod, who, you know, at the time I put up on a pedestal and he's taught me to put nobody on a pedestal this is the only reason I say that is there are no, <laughs> there are no gurus. Um, uh, that was one of our mantras at the old company, but uh, I was not going to waste his time with a silly question. I mm -hmm. needed to be well thought out uh, and and know exactly what I wanted to know. You don't waste a, a person's time like that. Now, now in hindsight, he'd probably say, oh, you know, no big deal, Dan. But no, we, we do need to formulate the right questions. Then those, those questions should be questions that we couldn't get answered doing our own work. Put the work in, put the work in. It's like kids. I remember when I was a, a teacher's assistant in my daughter's uh, school when she was just a little thing, fourth grade. And the kids would come up and say, how do I do this? Or what's the answer? And I'm like, have you, have you looked? Have you, have you checked? Have you tried? Yeah. No. Okay. Go sit down and try. Okay, folks, this is fourth grade stuff. You know, <laughs> find the answer. Ask the questions for the answers you can't find. I love it. I love it. Um, so obviously you're aware last year through a huge wrench in the industry, uh, because of COVID and shutdowns and all the things. And, and, you know, John and I, that's literally how John and I formed our company that we have a partnership in is through COVID. You know, we, we saw a hole in this industry of coaches that really needed help to understand how to navigate the online realm. But from your vantage point, where do you see our industry going over the next five to 10 years? Boy, that's a, that's a common question, right? And I love hearing all the answers because I, who knows who's, who's going to be close. Um, what I'll say is when I was asked that question at the beginning of the COVID and when people were talking, there was a lot of folks saying, oh, the industry's over. The brick and mortars are done. Gyms are never going to make it. 
blah, 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 blah. And I, and, uh, I predicted because I know what, what fitness did for me in my health and saved my life. I predicted that it would actually blow up because more people are aware that they set themselves up for, you know, possibly losing their life or worse symptoms, et cetera, if they have pre uh, preconditions or what do you call it? You know, they already have existing conditions, high blood pressure, they're overweight it's, and so forth. So what I predicted and what I'm seeing is the fitness industry is blowing up. So those of you that are out there, maybe just jumping into this as a career, congratulations. Yeah. Uh, you have no idea how desperate gyms are right now to hire personal trainers. It's, I've never seen anything like this. Just got off a call before this one. Never has our industry seen a shortage in trainers like we're seeing now. There are gyms refunding money to clients because they paid for sessions they can't service. So where is the, the industry going? First and foremost, it's growing. Uh, the other thing that a lot of folks said is that personal training would die and it would become online remote training because that's what we had to do. I don't believe that either. I don't believe you can ever replace that personal connection that happens when you're in the same space as another person. That being said, there are certainly a lot more opportunities than there ever were doing remote coaching and online coaching. Mm -hmm. uh, there are certifications for it. We have one here at ISSA. So again, learn, learn. Don't just jump in and think you're going to figure it out because somebody uh, has made mistakes that now they're memorializing. I like to say I'm not a very bright guy, but boy, have I made a lot of mistakes. And so, you know, try to learn from the others' mistakes and their guidance. But I would say the industry is going to blow up. It is blowing up. Choose your path, whether you want to do some gym, some online, you want to have a no walls business, you want to, you know, that type of a hybrid model where you're doing training a client, sometimes in person, sometimes remotely or using technology with apps and so forth. I think all of that is on the table and it's going to continue to grow in all of those areas. I dig it. I dig yeah. it. And that's, that's pretty much, I mean, you just kind of name my business. Like I still have a gym. I do online coaching as well. I just look to serve. And I, and I think if most coaches just continue with that mindset and have that servant attitude of who can I help, then everyone will be fine. Now we know, we know that's not always the case, but those who choose that mindset will absolutely thrive moving forward. Mm. Absolutely. And, and I think another thing we need to consider that we've always needed to consider, but it, it has become more important than ever is it's not all about bonds and guns. The, People just want to be healthier, okay? It's not about uh, how much your client can bench press now. And I made that mistake, and I really made that mistake before I learned from Rodney. And my wife won't let me train her anymore. She fired me about eight years ago because I made that mistake. <laughs> so, yeah, to this day, she won't let me train her. And that's because I lost, lost sight of her goal. And I superimposed my goal. Maybe I want buns and guns, or I want you to be able to do 20 push-ups. Well, she didn't give a lick about doing 20 push-ups. She wanted to lose weight. So we need to really understand that what is it that that person in front of us wants and, under, and, and recognize that maybe giving them the, the, the program or a prescription or whatever you want to call it of, okay, at 12 o'clock every day, take a walk around the building and put a bottle of water that's out of your reach so that every time you have to every time you drink, you have to stand up, send your stuff to a printer in another room. If you work in an office, some silly things that, but like, what? No, man, we do curls, dude. We, we do squats. We do banded squats. We do band walks. You know, that's what we do. <laughs> no, no. Sometimes just sitting more, uh, sitting and standing five, 10 more times a day, taking a walk break, taking a walk, playing with your kids more is the best thing for that person. So don't go, you know, think about how, what they really want. Most people, they just want to move better and feel better. They just want mm -hmm. to be happy. There's a small percent that wants to compete. Absolutely. There's athletes. Absolutely. But the majority of our clients in gyms, they just want a better life. Yeah. Amen to that. By Amen. the way, that's, we're making a meme out of that quote, by the way. <laughs> all about Buns and guns. I was like, <laughs> hold on a second. <laughs> I saw John light up real big when you said that. That was Buns awesome. And guns. Uh, uh, so, so before we get off of here, I do want to talk about the, the endurance stuff. Mm -hmm. I'm always intrigued by, <laughs> by people who do this crazy shit. Um, 
where did what what prompted you to get into the ultra side of things and then when did you decide i'm gonna keep doing this because nobody <laughs> just does an iron man and then goes oh, i'm gonna do another one like you're like you're you're doing some incredible feats here so how did that get started yeah well it's a very interesting story because when i came out of government and went into the private world um when i was in government i was uh they call it a specialty diver and a swift water rescue technician and all these things um and an instructor with the fbi so i say all that because i had to take these physical tests every year uh there was a five mile run and i forget how long i had to swim and do these different swims for the for the special uh, scuba team and i i dreaded them i wouldn't sleep the night before i'd get sick to my stomach because i was a horrible swimmer i'd barely make it and then when it came to because for the if you don't know if you are a scuba diver or a free diver or whatever you have fins on man all you gotta do is kick your feet you don't have to do anything with your arms right so i was terrible at it and the five mile run i'd go for a couple of runs maybe a mile leading up to it i'd, I'd get through it and i'd pass it uh but i just felt horrible afterwards and uh, you know we're, we're talking about my late 30s at this point so it's just not a good experience so running and biking are running and swimming. There's two events right there in triathlon that I sucked at and dreaded. What actually made me, prompted me to do it is one of my first clients, very first clients is a dear friend of mine who hired me to help him prepare to do his first Ironman. He was six foot six, 270 pounds. Woo. And I looked at this guy and I'm like, uh, I think these triathletes are a little smaller than you, dude. But hey, <laughs> I, I wasn't going to say, I wasn't going to dissuade him. And I told him, I said, Brian, I don't know anything about running, biking, or swimming. In fact, I hate, I don't like riding a bike at all, but I can help you with energy system development, injury prevention. I can make you stronger. I can make you more powerful. I can help you get to your training sessions without hurting your knees or your ankles or any of the injuries that are so common in, in the ultra world. He said, done. And he was with the hardest working to this day, the hardest working client I ever had. Well, he did it. He did the Ironman. And, uh, you know, I was real proud of him and, and it was like, cool, what's next? Well, he came in to train one day and I said, hey, he had two homes. He had one in San Diego. I go, how was your weekend? Good. What'd you do? Ah, you know, I went, I went out on the beach, was going to go hang out and they had a triathlon going on. So I borrowed this dude's beach cruiser <laughs> and did the triathlon. And that was my aha moment. All right. If this cat who's six foot six, 270 pounds is not made for endurance world, uh, can do a triathlon on a beach cruiser. I think I can do a sprint and that way I can practice what I preach and get better at coaching more mm -hmm. people like this. Mm -hmm. Somebody else hired me to do something similar. So I, I tried it. I did a 5k, then I did a half marathon, then I did a sprint triathlon every time thinking, Oh, that's enough. Check the box. And it, it, it my addiction, uh, addictive personality kind of came out, not to the sense where it, you know, I made sa huge sacrifices in my life or anything weird, but I just went, that's not hard enough. I like to work hard. I like to be challenged. I like to, I like to be the one that finished. I don't need to win, but I want to be the last one standing. That's my personality. And so it just never was hard enough. I did an Olympic. That wasn't hard enough. I did a half Ironman. I'm like, yeah, I got lots of juice. I did an Ironman. I'm like, I'm still standing. I mean, I'm, I'm cool. I'm going to be sore for a day or two, but that didn't kill me. So I was out jogging with a friend after the Ironman and I went, you know, is there anything harder? And they said, yeah, I think that you can do like multiple Ironmans. And so I did some Googling. I met a good dear friend, Steve Kirby, who was heading up the USA Ultra Triathlon. He said, come out and watch. I uh, went and watched a double Ironman and he talked me into doing a single while I was there. So I went, did an Ironman unprepared, <laughs> untrained, um, did it. Then I watched the double and I was hooked. Uh, and, and every time I finished, I felt like I, that wasn't enough. That wasn't enough. And that's what led me down the path of doing more and more. That's odd. How many have you done total? Do you know? I don't know. Um, to be honest with you, I think I've done four or five Ironman distance triathlons, uh, maybe five, a uh, couple of double Ironmans, a triple, which is actually the hardest, um, a quintuple. And then the double I did, the second double I did was a double that I swore I'd never do, which is the one that I went and watched that day because there's so much climbing on the bike. I'm, I'm at my race weight. I'm just over 200 pounds. I'm 200 and 
18, I think right now. I've, I haven't been under 200 pounds since I don't know when, high school maybe, like yeah. freshman year. Uh, so, so going those big distances is, uh, you know, pretty, most people aren't built like me. They call me the laughing line, linebacker out there because I don't train for triathlon all year. I train for size and function in the winter. And then I go out and train for triathlon in the spring. So this double, I swore I'd never do it. And um, yeah, I did it. And I actually passed out unconscious at the end. It was awesome. I sat down in a chair, I passed out. <laughs> I had blisters the size of grapes popping off the top of my toes. And I was like, yeah, this is where I want to be. I passed out during the quintuple. My wife thought I was dead. Um, <laughs> and, uh, she, she woke me up, slapping me on the butt. She's like, she thought I was dead. She's like, oh, Dan, Dan, Dan. She was hitting me. I'm like, oh yeah, man, I'm good. I'm good. I just need about a five minute lap. So I finally hit some of those things I wanted to feel. And that was where my body would not go anymore. But then it went more. Yeah. That's that Goggins level. Right? I was thinking yeah, about Goggins' yeah. book the whole time as you were telling that story. That, that's awesome. Yeah. Um, so so this kind of leads into some of our final questions for you because I, I'm really intrigued by this stuff. It, when, when, Like I said, the mindset of, of an ultra-endurance athlete is, is just far different than somebody going out and running a 5K or, or doing powerlifting or whatever. Um, what what do you think is the most impressive athletic feat that you've ever seen or or heard of? Wow. You know, I don't know that I have an answer for that because, first of all, um, I don't follow enough, you know, events and sports and people. Uh, I'm reading a book right now called Resilience about a guy who swam around the entire island of like the UK and uh, Ireland and all that, right? He swam it. it, took him over three months swimming 12 hours a day. That's kind of impressive. Um, my mentor just said, invented and did the Trans Am Tri, Trans America Tri, where he swam in, I forget how many miles, 20, 30 miles in the uh, ocean off of Florida, and then biked almost to Arizona and then ran to the Pacific Ocean. <laughs> took him a month. That's kind of impressive. And that's going every day. So I don't know what would be the most impressive, but, but you mentioned something I think is worth sharing. Uh, it's, it's mindset. It is mindset because like I said, I am built like a linebacker. I am not built like a triathlete, an old linebacker at that uh, with a lot of wrinkles, but, but it's mindset. And it's, it's that willingness to ignore pain and discomfort and embrace the suck flat out. I know it's an overused term, but embrace it and understand. And, you know, there's that question that we've all heard, but did it kill you? So if it's not killing me, my, my wife, who is my crew chief on every event has specific instructions going in. And those instructions are no matter what, don't let me stop. Make sure I keep eating. And if there's anything I say that alludes to me stopping, keep kicking me. And she's had to more than once and, and plant a seed in my, cause you get loopy. You get like, you hallucinate. I had some great hallucinate. Forget the drugs. Do, it. do, a, <laughs> do a triple Iron Man where you don't sleep uh, and you just go nonstop for 36 hours. Um, but, and, and the most important one is unless I'm injured with a, something that's going to permanently disable me, don't let me stop. So it's mindset you know, I'm spiral fracture or, you know, dislocation. Okay. We got to stop. But if I've got some bruises or scabs or I eat it on my bike and we can stop the bleeding, uh, blisters don't even talk about it. They go away. Yeah. Just it's all mindset. And that's life, man. That's, that's life. That life Amen. throws us curveballs. It throws us challenges. It throws us so many things that we completely unexpected. And we think, Oh gosh, I don't know if I can get through this. Yeah, you can. And it'll just make you stronger. It's all mindset. And the, the last thing, I know I'm chewing up your time, but I think there's a big takeaway. And it's why I, uh, my son attended all but my last quintuple. He was in school. And he started at a young age watching dad do these things. And here's what I wanted him to learn. And here's something to consider for the listeners. And it's not just the ultra world. This is life. Anything can be accomplished. Any goal that you set your mind to can be accomplished there are some key factors in you succeeding. Number one, create a plan and work your plan. It may never go as planned, but plan it and stick to it to the best of your ability. Number two, ask for help. Be willing to ask for help and ask for suggestions. Number three, 
surround yourself with a good team. But it isn't just about having the right team. It's about listening to them because they're going to tell you when to eat, when to change your shoes, when you need to do this, when you need to do that. Just shut up and listen. Get your head out of it. Get your ego out of it. You brought on that team for a reason because they're good at what they do. So shut up and do what they tell you to do. So have a good team, have a plan, be willing to ask for help, and then just focus. Anybody can do those things. And that's what I want my son to take away is he can accomplish anything he wants in life if he just does those four things. Mm, I love it. I love it. Um, kind of not so random question here. What's your favorite intra-race food? Like while I'm racing? Yeah. Oh, you're going to love this. Well, okay. There's favorite. And then there's what I really like from a nutrient perspective that isn't that bad. So I would say <laughs> my favorite is ham and cheese sandwiches. Yep. Ham and cheese sandwiches. And uh, uh, just plain old, throw the, you know, nothing fancy about it. That's probably my favorite. But my goat, the other thing that I eat a lot is I take a sandwich size Ziploc bag and I will take an avocado, a whole avocado peeled and everything in it and a banana and put those two inside of it uh, in the bag, squish it all up, add some sea salt to it. And I've got fats, I've got carbs, uh, a lot of fats, a lot of calories. I've got fiber, I've got sodium. Um, I've got, you know, basically your electrolytes and I squish, I bite the corner off the bag and squeeze it out, and suck that puppy down. So that's a, that's a power bomb right there now. So, so if you're ever feeling a little freaky and you want to try something new and, and you get some good, good energy source, that's a good one right there. Now I got to awesome. go share that with the OCR community. Nobody's doing that. We, we eat a lot of Uncrustables and M&Ms and bullshit. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, and everybody's different. I know a guy who does his whole race on, uh, I forget the brand. I should know this, but like McDonald's or something, little hamburgers, the entire <laughs> race on little yeah. hamburgers. There's yeah. people that like candy um, because of my body type, my somatotype. I do better with fats and proteins than I do with high uh, glycemic index carbohydrates. So I stay away from the goose, the gels, the drinks, and uh, I eat real food Nice, and nice. try to get as much fat as I can. Mm. All right, sir. Last question for you. Far away. If you, if you had a billboard that you could put a message on for everyone to see what would be the message on the billboard? Press on, press mm -hmm. on. So it's a saying I learned from a Navy SEAL I got training from years ago. And um, I like to, you know, add to it. It's, you know, get up, suit up, shut up and press on, but <laughs> just keep going, man. The, there's so many things that, that, that we think are obstacles. And I, you too, as entrepreneurs, you know this better than anyone. There's folks that tell you you can't do it. There's folks that tell you you're in the wrong profession. There's folks that tell you how you're gonna make a living. There's folks that say, this is a dumb idea. There's folks that say, you're not a triathlete. Shut up, press on, <laughs> press on. I love it, that's such a great message. Uh, Dan, this has been an amazing conversation. Um, Please share with the audience how they can reach out to you. If you have an ask of them, where they can follow, whatever you want to promote, tell the peoples. Yeah, yeah. Sure. Well, thank you for that. So full disclosure, I'm not, uh, I am not building my brand or anything. So I don't have, you know, a website or anything like that. I don't use Instagram. I have an account, but, and I only <laughs> post on it when I'm teaching and somebody says, how come you never post on your Instagram? Okay. Take a picture with me. I'll post it. <laughs> uh, but I do use Facebook a lot. And, um, just Dan Duran is my Facebook. I, I work for a great company, International Sports Sciences Association, like we mentioned earlier. Uh, we have, you know, all the social, the LinkedIn's, the, so, the Instagram and so forth. Um, we have a great uh, uh, team here that, that, you know, creates a lot of great education. So ISSAonline.com if you want to check out the company. Uh, but me as a person, uh, I would say Facebook is definitely the easiest way. I, I've, I, that's how you guys reach back out to me. I pay attention to it. I'm kind of old school. Yeah. And, uh, and I, I, with that, I'll say anybody out there who has any question at all, I will answer it. And I'll answer it. I don't mean like I'll, I'll, I'm always right kind of answer it. I mean, I will respond to you. 
um, immediately, as quick as possible. Every, y'all are my priorities. The world is much more, the people in this world are much more important than I am. So please don't hesitate to reach out if there's anything that I might be able to, to help with or answer a question, uh, if, especially around the addiction world, if, if you wanna reach out in that space. You know, I'm gonna close with this quick story is when I first started getting into recovery and start, was started getting into ultra world, I read a book by a guy named David Clark. Um, and he went from uh, opioid and alcohol addiction, weighed three, 400 pounds, et cetera, lost everything, lost his business, lost his family and started running. And he started running in the same part of Colorado I just moved from. So I used to run the same trail and think of David. And David ended up becoming a winner of like the, the Badwater Marathon or the Badwater, you know, the really tough one that's uh, done over in Arizona, California. And when I read that book, I messaged him on Facebook and I thought, oh, this guy will never get back to me. You know, he's too important. I'm just this nobody. He messaged me back immediately. He congratulated me on my sobriety. And I got to meet him twice in person running the Leadville Marathon. He was there. Uh, unfortunately, he actually passed away a freak incident at a hospital. Um, but I sell that because you never know who's going to inspire you. And so if there's anything in there that would help with your recovery, um, please reach out. I will always answer. Awesome, man. Again, thank you so much for your time, for your knowledge, for your wisdom. Tons of great. I took a bunch of notes. I hope if you're listening to this, you took a bunch of notes. And if not, you need to go back and take a bunch of notes because there was some, you know, this is deeper than just personal training. This is definitely a lot of life going on here. So we greatly appreciate it, Dan. Thank you again. John, take us on home, baby. Oh, and, and one more thing before you depart from our show. Be like Dan Duran. And go out there and get what you're worth, baby. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Damn good episode. Damn good.